Next, a special Illinois Channel presentation. We look back at the 1908 race riots. We'll first hear from historian Cullum Davis on what sparked the riots and about the violent sequence of events in Abraham Lincoln's hometown that shocked the nation. Professor Cullum Davis, thank you for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Pleased to be here. Thank we're, you. We're going to be talking today about one of Springfield's darkest chapters. It is the race riots of 1908. Mm -hmm. And why don't we start with, if you would, just give us a brief overview of what events happened, and then we can go into more detail. Well, it's important to understand that Springfield in 1908 uh, was a boom town in many ways. In fact, in the 20 years before the riot, the population of the city had doubled. So it was a rapidly growing city. It also was a rapidly growing African-American community. Uh, Springfield in the year 1910 had more, a higher percentage of black residents than any other city in the state of Illinois. Now that growth was not, I must say, state government particularly, though that was a factor in the employment here. There were a lot of industries and coal mines that employed workers, Germans, Irishmen, African Americans, and others. So this was a boom city uh, with the attendant social strains that often can accompany rapid growth in population and employment. Uh, so this was uh, the kind of place that in many sociologists' eyes would have been ripe for some sort of social disturbance. Uh, and that occurred, as they often do, uh, in the summertime, which is a, a favorite riot time. <laughs> and, and, and it also began with allegations of a sexual assault by a black man against a white woman. And that was always the bugaboo of American racial politics. Actually, two instances. A, a man by the name of Joe James had been accused of murdering a, a man by the name of Clergy Ballard, the suspicion being that Mr. Ballard was trying to protect his, protect his daughter from an assault. But the major event, the precipitating event, occurred on Thursday evening, August 13th, when uh, Mabel Hallam, who lived on the near north side of Springfield, told authorities that she had been assaulted by a black man and later identified a man named George Richardson as her assailant. That led to a very restive population, which in the evening hours of Friday the 14th, the start of a weekend, the saloons were open, a lot of the workers got off work at the coal mines or wherever and congregated in the kind of vice-ridden part of downtown known as the Levee along East Washington Street. And before long, a, uh, a, a gathering uh, occurred outside the county jail at, what is it, 7th? It was at 7th and Jefferson, I think. Clearly what the mob had in mind was to uh, uh, get some sort of uh, uh, lynch justice against George Richardson and perhaps Joe James as well. Wasn't there, by the way, the newspaper of that morning Hadn't it kind of enraged the community because of its headline? Ex uh, the, the local papers, the journal and the register, separate papers, clearly had fed the un unrest at the time, talking about a heinous crime and when will justice be done. It was an impatient demand for vigilante justice. I believe the uh, <clears throat> state journal headline that day was dragged from her bed and outraged by Negro. Yeah, right. Outraged being the term instead of raped, which right, she exactly. was alleging. As we know, all of that was a trumped up charge. We later learned, the people well, later after learned. After the fact, right. she recants her story. Right. She was having an affair and had been beaten up by her boyfriend and to use this, to use, have an excuse for her husband, she invented this fabrication, which of course was a very convenient thing for people to use in those days. At any rate, uh, the mob demanded uh, George Richardson, the sheriff, responsibly, uh, protected his uh, two uh, defendants and spirited them away to a neighboring jail outside of Springfield. Uh, angered by this, the mob then marched, of all things, on the restaurant of the man who owned the automobile that had been borrowed, a man named Harry Loper, who had a very popular restaurant on South Fifth Street between Adams and 
Monroe. And again, he was a white man. He was a white man. But he had an, one of the few automobiles in town. Uh, the mob, showing its wrath at that time, ransacked, uh, broke the windows, burned Harry Loper's car, which he had the bad judgment of parking outside the restaurant after it had been borrowed, and wrecked the place, essentially. Started fires, etc. Then the mob doubled back to the north and attacked... Can we say, it wasn't, wasn't the first victim also at Loper's restaurant? Uh, um, killed uh, death, by a, yeah, killed by uh, shots, someone, probably. Someone shot Police him. or something, yes, right. I, I can't remember, but you're right. And, and was one of the, the uh, rioters wh who was shot. Then the uh, mob went back to the levee area, which had a lot of white and African-American saloons, brothels, and uh, gambling dens. it wasn't actually a river levee. People no, no, but they was called that as they were in river towns. It was just a, an area right. of the town, right. which was exactly. a community. And uh, they selectively attacked the African-American commercial establishments, uh, burning them and destroying them. Then they uh, encountered their first black victim, Scott Burton, at the corner of 9th and Jefferson, where he had a barbershop and his home. He was a, success, a successful African-American entrepreneur, trying to protect, with a rifle, his property and his family. He was shot, and they dragged his body north to Madison Street and then east on Madison to, I believe, 15th Street, and they hanged his body from a tree at 15th and Madison. Now that is a lynching. That is to say, a lynching is a conspicuous demonstration of a mob's wrath against someone to set an example, because it's a public display. And, and, and so clearly... Though, I mean, and, and just to be clear, yes. he was already dead when they lynched him. Oh, yes, right, him. right, exactly. Then the mob along East Madison Street, which was kind of known as the Badlands. It was a rundown residential part of town. Again, selectively burned and destroyed African-American dwellings along about three or four blocks of East Madison Street. By that time, uh, militia troops helping the local authorities uh, quelled the riot and it ended Friday night's violence. Very quickly, Saturday evening, the same sort of pattern developed, a small mob of downtown. This time, they weren't out to destroy property. They were out to seize and lynch someone who, for whatever reason, they viewed as setting a bad example. He was married to a white woman. He lived in a fairly nice uh, uh, neighborhood on the near west side of town, though he was not attacked by his immediate neighbors who liked him. He was an 80-year-old former cobbler who owned property in town and had done very well for himself. But that very fact may also have been a reason he was attacked. He was, I guess you'd put it, an uppity black. So the mob marched right past the um, state armory on uh, 2nd Street, and then across the state capitol grounds to his home, demanded that he appear at the door. When he did, someone sliced his throat and hanged him from a tree in the Edwards schoolyard across the street. Uh, authorities arrived in time to cut him down when he was still alive, but he died at the hospital. And that, for all practical purposes, ended the really vicious violence of that riot. Though there were encounters and attacks uh, on the streetcars and on the streets of Springfield, for almost a week following that, picking on blacks who were alone and unable to defend themselves. This produced a mass exodus, temporarily, of Springfield blacks from the city to neighboring communities by train or foot, and it had a disastrous effect upon the reputation and the stability of this city, making, giving it first page and, and headline news in the major metropolitan newspapers of the country, from the Chicago Tribune to the New York Times, et cetera. <clears throat> Why did it get so much national attention? Because it was a, 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 an outbreak of racial violence, made all the more ironic by the fact that it was in Abraham Lincoln's hometown. And I would think maybe even especially because it was the, I mean, here we have in the hometown of the great emancipator. Well, that's the point, yes. Lincoln. Exactly. Because I guess, it, I mean, certainly at that time, there were probably lynchings going on there in, were lynchings, in the South, right? And there had been some uh, race riots, though there weren't race riots in the South were uncommon. More typically, there were lynchings in a more subjected population. There had been a few 
small race riots in northern cities, but Springfield's was by far uh, the most reported, whether because of its magnitude or because of the Lincoln connection, I don't know. But you know, here in Illinois, it set the course for two other dreadful race riots, even worse, in 1917 in East St. Louis and in 1919 in Chicago. So there, there came to be three dreadful race riots in, the, in three of the major cities of Illinois in that 10-year period. Were those other two race riots, were they linked in some sense to the Springfield? I mean, was, uh, not directly. did that lead to a poisonous atmosphere? Well, probably. Between the races? Probably. And there was, of course, the whole nation was wallowing in racism at that time and fears of blacks attacking whites, particularly white women. But, and there's no direct evidence that perpetrators of the riot in Springfield then traveled to those other cities. But it certainly set a, a precedent which those two cities uh, I mean, I suppose, and it, not to overstate this and, or draw wrong connections, just as we had the outbreak of the, uh, <clears throat> the riot in Watts in August of 65, right. mm -hmm. which then was followed by race, or, uh, riots, you might say, in right. cities across America throughout the subsequent th three or four following summers. Right. It may, to that extent, it's it, like it may a have contagion. set the stage. It, it, it's an idea in a, in a summertime on weekends that takes hold uh, once uh, that example has been set. After the, uh, the 15th on Saturday, mm -hmm. uh, you said that, that, was that basically the end of it? As it was far the as end the of the violence? overt and mass violence. Because by that time, several thousand uh, state uh, militia troops had been sent to Springfield from all over the state of Illinois, camped at the armory building and on the state house grounds, where they filled the entire state house grounds with their tents and mess uh, tents, and at other smaller locations around the city. For example, there was a small detachment that was headquartered at the site of the murder of Scott Burton on 9th and Jefferson. Photographs show these, these uh, establishments around the city. By that time, there was enough uh, law and order to prevent any further mob violence. Furthermore, the local Chamber of Commerce, if it was called by that at the time, I can't remember, reacted by then, Monday, with alarm at the terrible besmirching of Springfield's reputation that this had caused. Now, I have to tell you that it was obvious from witnesses to the rioting on Friday and Saturday night that a lot of the observers, if not participants, were well-dressed men and women. So this was not a strictly lower class phenomenon. Whether they were actively participating or not or just sightseeing isn't known, but they were part of those mobs. But by Monday, uh, clearly uh, the better people in Springfield realized that this was something that had to stop. They called uh, grand jury hearings to determine if there were some criminal acts committed. And uh, the city settled down, though as I say, there still were violent individual assaults for the remainder of that week. As a uh, <clears throat> couple of things followed up, one, again, one of the inst uh, things that sparked this was uh, Mabel Hallam, the wife of a streetcar conductor who accused a black caretaker of George Richardson of raping mm -hmm. her. Yes. That produced, as we alluded to earlier, the headline uh, of the 14th that right. then led to this. Now, she subsequently again comes out and admits right. that she had been lying right. about being raped. Right. She was having an affair. Right. Uh, cler clergy Ballard, who was the individual who was murdered, the white mm -hmm. uh, man who was murdered, I believe, on the July the 4th. Yes, I think it's early July, I know. Mm -hmm. chased, chased an intruder out of his home and was uh, cut to death by mm -hmm. a, a razor. Mm -hmm. They subsequently ar arrested and then executed Joe James, I convicted think a, and executed a, a black right. Uh, right. a black man who was more or less a uh, homeless a vagrant. He, he was yes, he didn't he hadn't lived in Springfield. Uh, a month or two later, he was put on trial for the murder of clergy Ballard, was found guilty, and was promptly uh, hanged legally hanged. And again, we really don't know whether he was guilty or not. It was a I mean, he was guilty yeah. in a court of law, but the the evidence I think that was presented was. It was a very speedy trial, and the defense attorney uh, 
halfway through the trial essentially gave up. Whether he felt that the case was hopeless or not, I don't know. But it would not qualify as a fair jury trial, capital jury trial, by today's standards by any stretch. But he was found guilty by a jury of his peers, not black peers, but peers. And one of the probably most significant things that, that resulted from this because of the national attention is there was a meeting in New York City then in January of 1909, about six months then following the events, uh, among concerned blacks and white reformers, and this led to the formation of the NAACP. That's correct. Some people have said that the NAACP was founded in Springfield. That's not correct. It was founded in New York State. But it was the events in Springfield that dramatized the need for a national civil rights organization, largely propelled by a, an article about the Springfield race riot that appeared in one important national magazine written by uh, William English Walling called Race War in the North. That's an incendiary title right there. And Walling recounted all the events of the race riot and the irony of it being in Lincoln's hometown. And that propelled Oswald Garrison Villard and other leading spokesmen for uh, African American rights to organize the NAACP. So you're right, that's a direct consequence of the riot. What were the, prior to these incidents that sparked the violence, what, do you know what the relationship was between the races prior to that? In the Springfield? In Springfield. Uh, occasional incidents. We, we found occasional uh, mention of uh, assaults on a city street against uppity Negroes, but nothing of this ma uh, magnitude. As they would have been referred to at the time. Exactly. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm using their language. Yes. Uh, uh, nothing of that magnitude or duration uh, as the riot itself. So this was a, a tense city, but it would be unfair to say that altogether the rioters were behaving because they were nervous about African Americans living in their neighborhoods or taking their jobs, because in neither, neither was the case. A very good study of the rioters has indicated that the rioters, by and large, were people who didn't know many African Americans. They lived in another part of town. And they had jobs that were secure and would not be held by African-American competitors for those jobs. The only two exceptions, as I said, were Scott Burton, the barber, and William Donegan, the landowner, who were well known in town and who became obviously the direct objects of a lynch mob attack. The rest of the African-Americans who were assaulted or had their homes or businesses burned were just blacks and quite clearly a major impulse behind the rioting had been to force as many blacks out of Springfield as possible. Uh, not unlike the pogroms in Russia back in the Tsar's days of the turn of the century, uh, where Cossack soldiers would force Russian Jews out of, out of that country. Similar sort of impulse. Some of those blacks left Springfield and probably never returned. But interestingly enough, most of them did return after things had settled down. You had mentioned that Springfield had become or had a larger black population than mm -hmm. many other communities percentage-wise. Do we know what the percent was? of uh, It the dropped black? somewhat in the 1920 census. I can't remember exactly. <coughs> Excuse me. And I wouldn't want to claim that that's a direct result of the riot, though it's reasonable to infer that Springfield uh, was not, had, had, did not remain the popular destination for southern blacks, sharecroppers migrating north that it had once been. There had been plentiful jobs here. Now there was clearly a hostile social environment. The, uh, and it's also clear that the repercussions in Springfield were very serious. Uh, you cannot find in, any instances of overt black resistance or civil rights organizing in Springfield for the next 40 or 50 years. And Springfield remained a very much a Jim Crow segregation city right up through World War II and into the 1950s and 60s. Well-known, respected blacks who were members of the Illinois House of Representatives or General Assembly and Senate coming from Chicago could not stay in the hotels of Springfield. They had to stay in private residences, like people like Cecil Partee, who was a distinguished black senator. So the, the And when was that? How re as in the recently? 1950s, uh, maybe 60s, I'm not sure. So clearly the, the repercussion here was 
a, a subjugation of a local black population and that lived in fear for a long, for several generations. The, the developments of, uh, of these events, aside from the, 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 men, the things we mentioned, did they have any other repercussions? Did the, did the legislature, as an example, uh, try to address it, to your knowledge? No, it didn't. There was no hearing or inquiry into the causes and consequences of the Springfield riot. There was an important such inquiry after the Chicago race riot of 1919. A, a legislative uh, panel held hearings, took testimony, and its report was, was uh, very valuable in trying to figure out how we can prevent future race riots, particularly in the North. Well, and as an example, in the 60s following the riots, you had a yes. lot of... right investment going on into the cities, so the federal government right. largely right. responded yeah. by trying to improve yeah. conditions, but now, that nothing... Didn't, that, none of that happened, but there was at least a, an honest inquiry into what caused this riot. And, uh, but in Springfield, uh, no such thing occurred. Probably the East St. Louis riot was as vicious as any of them. There are untold killings there. Uh, and uh, they basically leveled that city, which, you know, at that time, East St. Louis was a booming industrial and railroad center, booming, uh, steel making and so forth, and it was uh, wiped out by that riot. What's interesting is that not only, of course, Lincoln sure. being from uh, Springfield, but that at that time, of course, you would have had on the street, just as we've had veterans of the Second World War, at that time you would have had veterans all over from the Civil War. Of course. Of course. Um, <clears throat> now you can get into the whole debate about why, why was the Civil War fought right. and was it fought to free the slaves or not, right. but um, certainly some of those would have thought that they were fighting to uh, perhaps... Well, it's a complicated story. Uh, and I think there's no doubt I'm that just, I guess what, I was wondering what the, I'm getting at kind of what, what was the attitude yeah. of, of the population right. towards race at that time and one would have thought in their living memory having lived through many of them, the Civil War, well, but they the, might have had different attitudes. Clearly the Civil War did result in emancipation and even civil rights for African Americans, but that victory for them was short-lived. And any veterans of the Civil War who still in the 1900s felt that they had fought for black rights would be very few. Racism in this country was virulent at the turn of the century. And uh, lynchings were commonplace. Jim Crow segregation was commonplace. Voting restrictions were commonplace, even in northern states. So uh, that helps explain the, the mood in this country at that time. The irony is the early 1900s are known as the Progressive Era in the United States, a period of reform. And there were some people in Springfield who probably felt that they had to reform Springfield and get rid of all those brothels and gambling dens and crooked vote buying in Springfield. It happens that the blacks were the, the objects of that sort of attack, but there, there, there was a certain perverse form of reform that was behind the motives of some of the rioters. And after these communities were, were burnt down, yeah. um, do we know how, what happened then? What happened to these communities? Did they, did they have to pay for it themselves? Or yes. you didn't have the federal government coming in with some no urban help. renewal program? And very little insurance. So this was just tough luck for those people who were homeowners. Was there a lasting impact on the economy of the city? Do you know? I, I don't know. And I don't know that any such study has been conducted or how, how it could isolate that particular cause. Uh, it is true that it was a... a uh, bad mark on the reputation of Springfield on the, virtually on the eve of the centennial of Abraham Lincoln's birth. You know, they celebrated the Lincoln centennial in February of 1909. That's just, what, five months following the riot. Now, blacks were excluded from that celebration. Uh, but, it, so it, there was an embarrassment there. There's one other really interesting irony about the Springfield race riot, and it has to do with law and justice. The state's attorney in Springfield convened a grand jury the, the immediate week following the riots and took testimony in hearings and produced 117 indictments, criminal indictments, against riot perpetrators. Several months later, uh, when the state's attorney began bringing those cases to trial, he quickly discovered that he could not find 
the witnesses who had testified before the grand jury to testify in open trial. And uh, trial after trial uh, um, resulted in no conviction. Uh, and so he finally gave up. Clearly, the climate in Springfield was against reopening old wounds or settling old scores. Finally, out of those 117 indictments, there was one conviction. And that was against a young teenager for stealing one of the uh, militia soldiers' sabers. So it had nothing to do with the actual rioting itself. The, arsony, the arson, the damage to property, the physical assaults all went unpunished. So that kind of leaves a bitter taste as well. <clears throat> and as I understand, even uh, uh, Mabel uh, Hallam, Hallam. Who, who accused uh, Richardson, offered the uh, allegations right. of rape that then she recounted uh, was Re not recanted, held. Not recanted, recanted yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, she was, was never held. charged with a crime. Uh, you know, that, today that would be a major crime to a false uh, allegation. But she and her husband left town and, and she was never charged at all. So it, it, there's a lot of those loose ends that leave an uncomfortable feeling in one's mind. If uh, for the visitor who comes to Springfield today, on the other hand, there, are, there is now a, a walking tour yes. recounting the yes. history of right. this. Did, I didn't know, by the it way. It took a long time for that to happen. I remember trying 30 years ago to get the city council, I recommended to the then mayor, that there be some sort of memorial to the race riot, which, ugly as it was, was far and away the city's most important event in its history, far and away. There was no interest in it then. Then a couple of young schoolgirls about 15 years ago did the same, made the same request, and lo and behold, uh, they succeeded. And uh, the city sponsored the uh, development of a video history of the riot and the identification of, I think, five or six sites around town that were places like Hare Loper's Restaurant and the Levy area it's, and uh, so forth. And uh, they, they installed small markers at those sites. Now, I think a few of those markers actually were recently moved or put in storage because they, they were in the way of the Lincoln Presidential Museum and no. Library. And there's been a little controversy lately in town over whether those are going to be put back or not. So there's, you know, in a way, we're still fighting the battle over the race riot. <laughs> Have you had, heard any feedback from uh, tourists at all? or any? About the race riot? Well, oh. well, about the race riot, about these, these markers. I didn't know to what extent. No, there was just something in the paper about a week or so ago I, I noticed with some amusement. Uh, but no, I've, I've not heard anything from visitors. Uh, and, of course, the, uh, there was some long period of time, as you were saying, bef between uh, uh, the, the race riots and the influence of blacks uh, having any influence at all within the city as far as representation on the city council. It took uh, 60 years and a desegregation lawsuit in the schools and a, uh, a, a, a uh, lawsuit against city, the structure of city government to really bring about the development of local African-American political power sources. Uh, now, of course, we have city councilmen who are African-Americans and, and so forth. But it took a long time. As someone who's devoted their life to history, what would you say to someone who asks, why should we care about what happened in 1908? Well, uh, that's a fat pitch. <laughs> uh, not that history does not repeat itself, but there are lessons in history. And there are powerful lessons in this race riot that are every bit as germane today as they would have been then had anyone been paying attention. And those lessons are when you let rumor and gossip and innuendo and prejudice govern your behavior, you're in for trouble, whether it's a Western posse or a Springfield mob. And so that's the first lesson, that when you allow that mob action to uh, replace uh, lawful action, there will be tragic consequences uh, uh, that you cannot predict. Uh, another point would be that racism, unfortunately, has been a persistent strain and stain in American society. And here in Springfield, we have experienced it every bit as much as people have experienced it in Birmingham, Alabama.
So those would be two of the answers I would give. Well, again, Cullum Davis, thank you so much You're for sharing welcome. your knowledge with us on this. Thank you. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.